Good afternoon and welcome to BizTech's Asia-Pacific Cybersecurity Show. Every week, we update the region on the latest threats and incidences to help you better protect yourselves. Now, today is a special show where my regular co-host, Benjamin Ang, Head of Cyber and Homeland Defense at the Center of Excellence for, the National, Security, for National Security at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at NTU, is coming to us live from New York, where he's attending a UN cybersecurity conference. Now, Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. Now, Ben, for a start, tell us about the conference and what are its key objectives? What I'm attending is the UN Open-Ended Working Group, or OEWG, on developments in the field of information and telecommunications in the context of international security. But basically, what are the current cyber threats facing countries and how should countries behave towards one another in cyberspace? Okay, that's interesting. Now, tell us a little bit more about this. Now, what's what's the old the, the framework that this started, and who are the members of, of who take part in this UN group for government experts? Well, it started way back in nineteen ninety nine, where the UN decided to look into agree to look into cyber issues between states. Then they convened what is called the UN Group of Governmental Experts or GGE on advancing responsible state behavior in cyberspace in the context of international security. Basically, okay. how states should behave towards one another in cyber conflict. And that ran okay. from 2004. Hmm. Okay, so how states should behave towards each other, that landscape is shifting dramatically um, also because of the complexities around cybersecurity in terms of whether it is state-sponsored, uh, cyber terrorism, uh, and also how cyber security has just become now um, a heightened level of importance within each uh, state itself. How, who are the industry players who are participating in this? Well, here's the thing. Usually for UN processes, it's only the states that attend. And in this particular process, we are fortunate enough that it was made open for non-government stakeholders to apply to attend. So non-government stakeholders would include private corporations, business associations, NGOs, academic institutions like mine. So we applied. Uh, but I can say that some of the major players were vetoed by some major powers. For example, Microsoft was vetoed. Okay, so I'm puzzled here. When you have a discussion at high level like this, you should be having the Microsofts, the 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 all the the, the large players in cybersecurity, the 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 the, the Acronesses, the 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 dark tracers, all those people who are leaders in cybersecurity should be involved in this conversation. What was the argument uh, uh, against large vendors and and security experts attending this? That's the thing. The veto is not does not have to have a reason. But in the discussions, some of the states, major powers, have referred to Microsoft as a political actor. So I would then hazard a guess that they don't like Microsoft because of political reasons. And maybe it's because Microsoft has been too active in fighting off certain cyber attacks from certain countries. That's one possibility. And so Microsoft is very sore. I mean, they they are ready to participate, but they just haven't been allowed to participate in the formal processes. So none of the large cybersecurity global companies are involved in this? No. That's, that seems like a glaring miss for me. And, and I think that is something that probably needs to be addressed because when you have, they have the data. They know where attacks are coming from. They know the processes. They, they are probably the best advisors in terms of then helping the industry, the, the, the states themselves, protect themselves better. As much as I am grateful that my group hasn't been vetoed, yes, I do feel that the private sector, uh, those who actually are owners of the networks and who are owners of the tools and the resources to be able to identify where the threats are coming from and how these threats can be dealt with should be uh, allowed to come to the table. And some have been vetoed, some have just not applied. Okay, so I think, Ben, this is subject of a different conversation that we probably need to invite a panel 
and have a discussion a little bit further. But but I think moving on to the conference itself, what are some of the key topics that have now been discussed? So the topics are interesting because uh, I'll give you an example. UN member states agree that international law applies to cyberspace. So, for example, states should not be conducting internationally wrongful acts. But they have not reached agreement on how international law applies. For example, what is a wrongful act? Do okay. we need to spend the next few years negotiating a binding treaty? Or do we immediately start applying principles from the international law of the physical world? So, that's a good news, bad news. Mm -hmm. Then also, the states agree that states should respect the sovereignty of other states in cyberspace and not take actions that violate sovereignty. But then they haven't agreed on what actions violate sovereignty. Is a ransomware attack violating sovereignty or is spreading information violating sovereignty? And when you talk about ransomware, that brings me to the next question, which is states agree that states should not attack one another but they haven't agreed on what amount to an arm attack. Because in the physical world, an arm attack means you've got physical damage or loss of life. But in Correct. the cyber world, you can destroy an entire country's economy without ever causing any physical damage or killing anybody. So it sounds like this is a really a, like a huge work in progress in terms Absolutely. of really defining defining the, the, the scope of engagements, the, the penalties around it, and the laws that apply to it. Absolutely. And I think the more hits we can get involved in this process, which is running from 2021 to 2025, the better. And since we have a lot of people in the private sector field, then I encourage them to engage with your governments to see how you can be of help to move this. Because it's in everybody's interest to have uh, more certainty in what the law is in cyberspace. Now, Ben, then, looking looking then, and this is something that we probably need to have a, a separate discussion and invite different stakeholders and have a cybersecurity show incorporating vendors, state, uh, 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 you know, academics like yourself uh, from Academic Association and also from governments to have this broader conversation on what is the thinking around this and how they're going to move the needle moving forward. You know, however, Ben, coming back to this conference itself, what are some of the key trends that you're seeing uh, that, that people are excited about? I think the biggest um, issue that is facing this process is the geopolitical situation. Because of that, that's contributing to why certain organizations get vetoed. It's also making it difficult to reach consensus I have to say that the chair has been doing a great job in managing to keep the process going uh, and for the past uh, already six meetings of formal meetings already but i can say that uh, the western countries are uh, condemn russia for the ukraine war and then russia condemns the western countries for the ukraine war so it it's a difficult situation for them to be able to reach consensus Okay, so the geopolitical, the larger geopolitical issues have hijacked the, the, the issues that are at hand really to talk around cybersecurity and, and, and how they could move forward. Yes, which then leaves a space for the smaller states. You know, they are major powers, right? But there's still another 180, 190 smaller states in the world. We are more of us than they are of them. And the smaller states have a voice at the UN. All the states can say, hey, you know, we know the geopolitical situation is bad, but still there is a need to come to a consensus of what should be the rules that are governing state behavior in cyberspace. And so, yeah. so Ben, then for, for uh, people like yourself and also from Singapore, and also then broad, uh, broadly from ASEAN, what are the key objectives of, of, of uh, people like you attending this conference, what, what do you hope to achieve? As an academic, all I can do is give my advice, my expert advice. It's the states who have to be the one to say, we want to agree on the rules. And I think if there are more participants from the non-governmental side from ASEAN, that would also help. 
because I look around the room and there aren't other ASEAN non-government stakeholders. So if they can come forward and help their states to raise that voice and say, you know, geopolitics aside, can we come to a consensus? Since we're here to talk about cyber operations state to state, let's focus on that and come up with some rules that can provide some security and safety for all of us. Now, Ben, as always, thank you very much for your insights and thanks for staying up so late to do this show. Always a pleasure, Brian. Now, that's it for this week's APAC Cybersecurity Show. We've been speaking to Benjamin Ang, Head of Cyber and Homeland Defense at the Center of Excellence for National Security at the Nanyang Technological University on BizTech's APAC Cybersecurity Show. I'm Brian Fernandez. This interview will also be on our website, www.biztech.asia as well as our social media platforms. It'll also be on our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.